Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, the theme of our panel is whether the innovation created by the private sector, specifically entrepreneurs and their backers, is creating needed social returns. It's an honor to address this question early in the conference, as I believe it implicitly raises some of the greatest issues we face collectively within this conference. When we speak about innovation, we are talking about presumably positive changes to a complex environment through things like novel discoveries in science or engineering, new packaging of known technologies, new ways of organizing, and other things. It has become easy, however, to take all innovation as a kind of positive natural outcome for the good of all. It's very easy to lose sight of the fact that any innovation takes place within a system of pre-existing, a pre-existing system of values. I want to repeat that because it struck me yesterday when I was reading Simon Head's book. Any innovation takes place within a pre-existing system of values. And as a result, it can serve to justify that system as much as it changes it. When we innovate in the name of private returns, we strengthen the idea that private returns matter. When we innovate in the name of social change, as in the civil rights movement, we strengthen that choice. And likewise, when we repress innovation, as Mr. Johnson referred to in the 17th century, or when Japan, for example, went through its Tokugawa period closing itself to the West, there is a reification of older values and innovation is repressed in service of those values. These are choices, and as such, they are choices that should be made mindfully. It's reasonable to say that the last several decades have primarily looked at innovation within a value system that favors entrepreneurial endeavor, with any implicit understanding that this will affect social returns, be they in wealth, material comfort, safety, or meaningful work. As you will soon see, many of our panelists do not agree with this statement. Um, perhaps best noted our lead speaker when my remarks are done, Mariana, who, by the way, has kindly taken aside 400 copies of her book, The Entrepreneurial State, for free to attendees of this conference, and we'll be signing them tomorrow at the coffee break. And it's, it's worth your time, this read. Kind, thank you for that. Not only that, I think the Wall Street Journal called it heretical, right? Forbes, Forbes called it heretical. Better still, right to the belly of it. Um, so, then, um, and Simon also, I, th I believe, will touch on this. Certainly in his book, he touches on a challenge to this value system in as much as he sees many of the um, implicit values of scientific management and computer-driven systems as dehumanizing and ultimately pernicious. There are certainly alternatives worth exploring. And certainly, if we do not deliver on social gains inside our value system, we can encounter extremely unfortunate human consequences. And it's not trivial to say, we might make a ton of money, but build a world that we want to apologize to our grandchildren over. Additionally, as the panel description notes, much of the innovation that we now focus on takes place within a context of our age, one of broadly defined machine intelligence, sensors, and data sets. This is also seen as giving rise to a certain self-reinforcing value system, and one not just limited to the tech sector or computers. I'm sure, June, you could cite many um, instances in which computer-driven sensors uh, and data are affecting medical science now or other biological endeavors. I recently spoke to someone who's using supercomputing to change the nature of paint and coatings. So it really touches many, many other aspects away from that world itself, and its values travel with it. The particulars of this also deserve closer examination. I believe we'll also be touching on that. Um, that sounds like enough for 90 minutes, right? Um, so that's enough for me. I'd like to now hear from our presenters, and then we'll have a discussion among ourselves. Uh, Marianne, I'd like you to kick it off, please. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, let me turn on my timer here. 
Um, so what I would like to do is, where are the slides? Are they there? Well, I'll wait for them to come up, is to actually challenge the um, assumption of this panel, because if you read in your brochure, it says, is material prosperity created by our entrepreneurs enough to produce the social returns demanded in today's world? And the, the real question is, you know, where do these returns come from? And then how do we actually, if you want, distribute them both privately and socially? And how, in my opinion, has the narrative of where the returns come from actually created an increasing disconnect between these two? Um, and just to sort of start off with the context in which we are living today, and this is Andy Haldane's data, and the reason why I think this conference, but many conferences around the world are focusing increasingly on innovation, and industrial policy is finally no longer a bad word, is that you know, value extraction activities, which here are if you want, proxied by uh, value added, uh, the percentage of just financial intermediation, has outpaced completely the growth of what some people call the real economy. Now, this has made uh, policymakers really want to have sort of proper growth, innovation-led growth, smart growth. And the problem, I think, is that we don't think enough about what we actually mean about financialization. So it's not if you want the big bad hedge funds and the credit default swaps versus this wonderful real economy that we need to concentrate our industrial policy around, but it's really understanding just how sick the real economy has in fact become, which I think Jim was also alluding to before in his um, opening remarks today when he referred to, for example, the hoarding rates, which by the way are uh, what is it now, $2 trillion in the US, uh, $1 trillion in Europe, and Canada alone, $600 billion hoarded under pillows of companies. Um, how do we actually get innovation policy to engage with that problem instead of remaining, if you want, in the, in the uh, uh, side uh, margins of industrial policy? And what I mean by sick, uh, Bill Lazonic, who's here, uh, writes a lot about this, I mean not just the hoarding, but just how much money in terms of percentage of net earnings is actually being spent on these value extraction practices of which these share buybacks here are just a proxy for. And the line that should be worrying you is that black line which just starts peaking. It almost looks like it caused the crisis, which is repurchases um, over R&D spending. And some of the leading companies out there which are lobbying governments for different types of uh, innovation policies, like in the UK we have this patent box, which if we have time maybe in the discussion I'll talk about just how dysfunctional that is, are actually the lead buybackers. Okay, so in order to reform this dysfunctional system and actually to have a serious debate about social um, and private returns and also what to do with those returns in the future, I think it's really important to talk about what do we actually know about, if you want, you know, capitalism in terms of the private and the public sector. And in, in, in terms of not only how they interact, but actually how markets were formed in the first place. And what's fascinating is how we still are completely uh, blinded today by this market failure framework, which is still guiding lots of innovation policy, um, which is all about sort of assuming that you know, underneath you have this business sector, which is actually dying to invest, wanting to innovate, but is actually impeded by different types of problems. Um, and what government's role is, is to fix, sorry, I forgot about all you guys here, uh, fix uh, you know, different types of market failures, then also, of course, to create the conditions for innovation for this dynamic private sector to do its thing. So you know, the typical market failure would be uh, public goods like basic research, really hard to appropriate the returns from that, hence there's too little investment in it, and hence the public sector has to come in and, and do its thing. A very different view, which I'll try to be building on throughout the talk, or not the talk anyway, like 10 minutes left, is um, the view of government as doing much more than just fixing markets, actually actively creating and shaping them. And I don't have time to say anything about Karl Polanyi, but if you're interested in really understanding the role of public policy in shaping and creating markets, read that book. Um, and basically what it does is it really um, also, I think, should be interacting today with people like myself and Bill Janeway, who've been referring to a very different type of framework, which we talk about in terms of mission-oriented investments, which um, really actually properly describes what actually happened in places like Silicon Valley, but I would argue also in places like China, Brazil, Finland, Denmark, and Germany. And again, perhaps we can take that global perspective more in the um, discussion, which is 
um, you know, that what we actually know is that the private sector follows after big, if you want, courageous investments have been made um, in, in very difficult areas, right? So actually imagining the internet before the internet, imagining nanotech before nanotech, because what we don't have, we don't have uh, business wanting to do nanotech and then going to government and asking for different types of investments that will make it easier. As you know, Warren Buffett has this wonderful quote. He says, um, I never made an investment that was impeded, or I, th I think his quote was actually referring to 1976. He said, even when capital gains was 40% in 1976, that did not impede me from investing. What actually drove me to invest was my perception about where the opportunities are. And the reason I have this quote here from Keynes, which I think is great, is because I don't think Keynes did himself a favor with the word animal spirits, because in fact, that same word makes you think um, you know, that you do have these kind of wolves, these lions, these tigers, that are what is making, in fact, investment so, whether it's pro-cyclical or just volatile, and then government has to come in and stabilize aggregate demand. In this quote, um, in this uh, letter that he wrote to Roosevelt, he is asking, oh dear, you know, what if actually we don't have these lions, wolves, and tigers, but we actually have domesticated animals, you know, gerbils, hamsters, pussycats. You know, how different is actually the role of public policy in that setting? And I would argue, without being sort of too provocative, that is, in fact, what we have. We do not have a lion in a cage and government needed to remove different types of impediments, whether it's introducing R&D tax credits, whether it's removing different types of regulations. What we have seen across the world in the few regions that have actually achieved innovation-led growth and I say regions because many you know, countries, as you know, are very skewed in terms of their uh, ability within that country to achieve this kind of growth, um, has actually been this mission-oriented investment that I was talking about before, which has led to not just technology, but important revolutionary, game-changing technologies. Um, and I use that word revolutionary, of course, because we often think, again, of Silicon Valley full of these revolutionary entrepreneurs. Steve Jobs' is wonderful uh, talk to that Stanford graduating class, you know, said, be hungry, be foolish. Well, in fact, it actually took really foolish, crazy government to invest in these areas before they were profitable. And what I mean by mission-oriented is that it's not just about funding the public good problem, basic research. What you see here in the orange are actually different types of public investments, which in fact have been fundamental across that entire innovation chain. Um, even uh, you know, early stage seed funding for companies, which actually if you start calculating how much the CIA itself through its public uh, venture capital fund, Incutel, spent on venture capital, it's actually very large and in some years higher than the amount of private venture capital. Um, and you know, this is my usual uh, graph that I take from my book, which actually says, you know, what made your iPhone so revolutionary? It's actually what you can do with it. Every single technology behind that phone that actually makes you use it in a smart and not stupid way was funded by government, internet, GPS, touchscreen display, Siri. Um, and many you know, people in Europe say, oh, but you're just talking about the military industrial complex. Well, no, this kind of uh, courageous mission-oriented spending across that entire innovation chain also extends to health, to energy. Uh, this is uh, also coming from some of Bill Azonik's work where he talks about just how much the NIH has been spending in, uh, in, in a 2012, 32 billion. Uh, Marsha Angel's wonderful book talks about this as well, and she says that it's responsible for actually creating the most risky, uh, revolutionary new drugs, these new molecular entities with priority rating. Um, so, uh, and as I said, it's not just about research, whether it's applied or basic, but also this early stage funding for companies, which as you see in this graph has actually had to increase over time. These are the SBIR funds, it's not a surprise because actually venture capital itself has become increasingly short-termist, right? All focused on the exit, focused on returns in three years' time, mainly targeting that exit through an IPO. This is not good for innovation that is very risky but also takes a long time, 15 to 20 years in biotech and clean technology today. In fact, in clean tech today, we have very little VC, private VC funding in that upper right-hand quadrant where you have that real sort of um, risk and uncertainty, high capital intensity, high technological and market risk. And what's actually quite interesting, you know, we're talking all the time about these ecosystems. Can I have some water? I was told that it was going to be up there, but I guess not. Um, but in fact, the real problem is to what degree do we even have indicators of how 
if you want, parasitic versus symbiotic these ecosystems are, and the really worrying thing we see in energy mm, is just how disengaged the private sector is. We don't have in energy today the kind of companies that we had uh, building the IT revolution, which also Bill Janeway's great book talks about, so the Xerox Park, Bell Labs kind of co-investment alongside the state in this very difficult uh, risk-taking process. And what's interesting is if you look across the world, and there's great data out there, for example, Bloomberg's um, new energy finance data, you can actually calculate who really is engaging in this big mission, right? The next big mission in terms of thinking of uh, today's uh, social possibilities that the brochure talks about, solving climate change, public investment banks. Okay, so public finance is actually playing a leading role today more, by the way, than government funding through the sort of ARPA E-type programs, which are very important, that are trying to do for energy what DARPA did for the internet. But state investment banks across the world, KFW in Germany, there's actually four of them, KFW in Germany, the China Development Bank, uh, the Brazilian Development Bank, and I've heard that uh, this whole conference is actually being live streamed in Brazil, um, and the European Investment Bank completely out you know, outnumber the amount of investments actually being done by private venture capital, private equity, stock market, and corporate investment. And what's interesting also is that this counter-cyclical spending that these banks have been so important for since the crisis have actually been directed. They have actually picked this challenge. Um, and of course, we have no way to talk about it. So the Chinese Development Bank, which um, also provided the loans for the number one player today in telecommunications, Huawei, with I think it was a $2 billion loan, and they're also playing a very important role in funding uh, China's big um, uh, innovation strategy around green, you know, are then called uh, anti-competitive, which is a real dilemma for competition policy, of course, because if the point of this conference is that you uh, compete through innovation, and if it's true that private finance is retreating from that kind of high-risk, long-term financing, well, where else is this money gonna come from? Shouldn't we start also rethinking how we think about uh, anti-competitive type policies, but this is a, a bigger issue. But the real question then is, just coming back to the theme of this particular session, is I really believe that to get to then this point about, you know, how do we even think about the private and social returns really has to be, um, if you want, frameworked around our analysis of, you know, where uh, where did value come from? Who are this collective group of different actors in this innovation space creating these ecosystems? And who's entering where? You know, at what time? Because innovation takes a long time, but those actually taking a lot more risk should actually potentially be also rewarded. What we have today instead is a type of language that is really only recognized the risk taken by some of these agents, and at best the state is seen as simply facilitating that process. Um, I mean, just think of the word de-risking. You know, is that what the state did when it funded the internet? It just de-risked the private sector? No, it took on that risk, right? And as, you stu as soon as you start changing that kind of language to taking on risk, sharing risks, you immediately then also have to come to the point of sharing the rewards. If you're just de-risking, it's, it's uh, you know, um, much more problematic. And so, coming to this whole big problem, which I think indirectly this panel is trying to address, which is really the relationship between innovation and inequality, and I actually hope that we actually go to it more directly, and this is Piketty's numbers, um, which I uh, stole from um, uh, Cassidy's wonderful uh, New Yorker piece, because um, it was much easier to do than to go to the book, which I don't have yet. Um, you know, his whole point is that the return on capital has outpaced in recent decades the return on, well, um, the growth rate. And I think we need an analysis of why that is. And my view, related to everything I've just said, is that that return on capital has actually been facilitated and enabled by this wrong discussion, this wrong narrative. So it was actually, um, and Bill Azonik and I have just written a paper on this called Risks and Rewards, Innovation and Inequality, it was actually the National Venture Capital Association that formed in 1976 and its first sort of lobbying uh, initiative was to lobby government to reduce capital gains tax, which Piketty talks about a lot in the book, um, from 40% to 20% in just five years. So in 1981, it was 20%. Okay, that kind of reduction in tax was done through a narrative of we are the risk takers, we are the entrepreneurs, reduce this tax, we will invest. 
which again, coming back to the earlier point of Warren Buffett himself saying in 1976, when uh, capital gains was 40%, that did not uh, impede me from investing. That's not what drives my investment. But this kind of constant narrative that what the problem is is these different impediments and just get them out and we will go misses the point that in fact venture capital only entered areas like biotech and today in clean tech about 15 to 20 years after the government took that big risk. And in innovation studies, in the economics of innovation, we talk a lot about path dependency, persistence, the, cum the cumulativity of innovation. And if you think of the returns, right, as under this cumulative uh, distribution curve, the point is that certain agents, because the analysis has been wrong of what their contribution has been, they're important, but they're not the most important, have actually been able to both enter late and yet actually capture that entire uh, you know, integral underneath that distribution curve. Let me finish, because I think I've already gone over 10 seconds. Um, and so what can we actually do about it? Well, first of all, you know, why don't we actually uh, uh, you know, not just socialize the risk, but also the rewards? How? It's not going to happen just through some sort of trickle down, trickle down or, or, or through tax. We know that Apple, Google, and Amazon don't pay that much tax. I think we need to start this debate about you know, retaining some equity, retaining some a uh, golden share of the IPR, income contingent loans, something. But the debate doesn't even start until we actually understand the taxpayers and the public sector um, and the social, uh, 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 if you want, ecosystem of actually having played this revolutionary role. Um, and only once we start having this debate can we actually start achieving what everyone seems to be talking about, which is growth that is not only smart, but also inclusive. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Simon? Uh, I'm going to talk sitting down, so I hope you can all see me and hear me. Uh, I want to start by saying, as somebody who has organized quite a lot of conferences for the New York Review of Books, that this is a wonderful title for this conference, Human After All, because amidst the cacophony of rhetoric about processes, and technologies and business plans and management theory, at the center of it all is us, all of us, whether we're working on the floor at Amazon or whether we're candidates for the Nobel Prize. And there are certain profound ethical questions and dimensions which surround us in the workplace. And we are all embedded in the economy. And these values have to do with dignity whether the workplace upholds our dignity, and whether the workplace gives us the scope to make the most of the talents we have. Again, whether we're at Walmart or Amazon or whether we're at Harvard in the economics department. That is a demand of economies, and I think it ties up with the meaning of social returns in the prospectus. In looking at the social returns from innovation, we're confronted with a fact, a phenomenon of political economy of enormous significance, which I think has to stand absolutely at the center of what we're talking about on this panel. And that is that if we look at the last 20 plus years, we see that there has been this enormous investment in information technologies which have transformed the American workplace. And I'm going to concentrate on, on the United States economy in this, in this presentation, this huge infusion of investment in information technologies. And at the same time, we have a spectacular growth of inequality unparalleled since the Gilded Age, which comprises both the accumulation of wealth and earnings at the earnings pinnacle, which Piketty and Saiz's research demonstrates so clearly, but also the stagnation or decline of the real income of almost everybody else. And that's the phenomenon which I think we have to explain as a negative yield of social return, if you like. And that's what I'm going to try to do. And in doing it, I want to concentrate on a concept which features very prominently in the work of the economists who dominate this field. It's the concept of skill-based technological change. And I want to focus particularly on the concept of bias. And I want to dissent from these mainstream economists. I think that their work is fatally flawed 
because they have failed to make an important distinction between two, two kinds of bias. And, and the economists I have in mind are Brynjolfsson and his collaborator McAfee, uh, Goldin and Katz, Brezhnev, Auschwitz, Stanford, Autor, a whole constellation of them, a lot of them in, in Cambridge. And I want to focus on these two, these two senses of bias. The first sense of bias is the one that features very prominently in their work and I think has great validity. And that is that there are certain interactions between technology and work which are almost uh, mechanically determined by the nature of the technologies. The technologies by their very nature eliminate or make redundant or obsolete certain skills and we've seen this happening since Adam Smith's famous case of the pin factory. We saw it with the weavers who Karl Marx writes about at length in Das Kapital. We saw it with our dear friend the horse who was displaced as a vehicle of transportation and we've seen it with an increasing number of skills in the computer age. And we've seen it, for example, in the way in which the, main, the mainframe computer, when it came into operation in the 60s, uh, made obsolete all kinds of categories of back office work in corporations. So here we have a very clear causal relationship between technologies and skills, which eliminates or diminishes a whole range of skills. And we also have a chain of causation in favor of certain higher skills, and that's something which the mainstream economists also emphasize. And we see that with these complex management systems which pull together different technologies to, to achieve very complex tasks. Uh, and we see that the people in the technology companies, IBM, SAP, uh, who design the systems, there's a demand for their skills, their, is the demand for the middleman skills, if you like, of management consultants, of Gartner Corporation or SAP who stand between the equipment manufacturers and the corporate clients. And then there are the in-house technicians in the corporations who supervise the installations of the systems and maintain them once they're there. So, that, so there is a kind of bias with these technologies towards the creation of certain high skills. So, but the concept of skill bias technological change as it works uh, among these mainstream economists is to look at these two dual functions happening at the same time, favoring some, some skills at the expense of others and therefore being a force for inequality. So far, so good. So far, so good, but not good enough in my view because there is a whole category of bias which the mainstream economists have completely failed to take into account and, and to provide a proper analysis of. And in my view, this invalidates their work, uh, frankly. Uh, and the bias I'm talking about arises when you look at contexts where the complex technologies which are pulled together to form what I call computer business systems are operating. And so we're looking at technologies of data warehouses, databases, we're talking about the foundation technologies for these, we're talking about the internet, we're talking about the cloud as a kind of rented space, and then we're talking about a whole range of workplace technologies which determine the nature of work. We're talking about workflow management systems, we're talking about targeting systems, we're talking very much about monitoring systems. We're talking about expert systems which to varying degrees replace the cognitive functions in business processes. And we're also talking about a whole system of what I call corporate panoptics, or what Gartner calls corporate performance management, which provides the vast quantities of information arising from these business processes for senior management to have a panoptic view of the, how, how the corporation is getting on. So what I'm arguing against Brynjolfsson and co. is that when we look at the operation of these systems, there are biases which arise not from the nature of the technologies themselves, but from business culture, power, and the ways in which management decide that these technologies should be used. And this bias is not inherent to the technologies. So let, let us now do something which uh, 
the management consultants encourage us to do, which is to drill down. We drill down from the very abstract level to the very particular level. And I want to take an extreme example of this kind of bias I'm talking about. And that's Amazon Corporation. In my view, Amazon is a rogue corporation. Rogue. And the reason is that if you take the complex of technologies that Amazon uses, it combines them in such a way that it pushes the workforce to the limits and beyond in the interests of increasing productivity. It pushes them to the extent that if you look at older workers at Amazon, over 40, it becomes very difficult for them to do the work there. Let me quote from somebody I interviewed. This is what it's like. You have to stow 1,200 items per hour. If you make one mistake for 1,100 items, you're stopped and you're fined. Four write-ups and you're fired. Now, it so happened that the BBC, which is not an institution renowned for its investigative reported, managed to get a, a worker inside an Amazon depot with a camera who could monitor what was going on. And in my view, it was a vision of hell. Uh, for one thing, each Amazon worker has a little computer attached. And if that worker is not making the time target for his sub job, then the computer begins to beep, and he has a demerit. Now, a reason why I chose Amazon is also because in Germany, where the balance between labor and management is rather different from what it is in the UK and the US, there's a real struggle going on between Amazon and the main service union to represent and organize the workforce. The union is called Verdi. And of course, it's a struggle about earnings and benefits, but it's also a struggle about technology regimes. It's a struggle about bias. It's a struggle about whether the extreme bias of Jeff Bezos should be to some extent moderated in the interests of the dignity, in my view, and welfare of the workforce. That these tags should be modified. They shouldn't be. That the workers should be given a decent lunch hour, and that you should not have this accumulation of information so that every single time a worker meets, fails to meet his deadline by a few seconds, he's got a demerit and he's on the way to being fired. So this is a struggle about bias and about production regimes. And it's, it's a struggle I hope the union wins for reasons of ethics as much as economics. Well, let me finish by going from the rather low-skilled workforce of Amazon. And the issue here is not skill v. de-skilling. It's the issue of human dignity and well-being to a more elevated workforce, the uh, workplace, which I'm extremely familiar with. And that's what's going on at the University of Oxford, where I've been associated for the last 10 years. Now, you may think that what goes on at Oxford doesn't really have much to do with what goes on at Amazon Corporation. It actually has a lot to do with it, because we have, for governing our scholarly work, a management system which embodies a bias, which in a way is as vicious as the one at Amazon. And it's a regime imposed on us by all UK governments since Mrs. Thatcher's time, and it's a production regime for the output of scholarly works over a period usually of about five years, which of course is the period of the Soviet planning system. And there are big parallels, I think, between uh, the Soviet system and ours. And so what you have is the work of the scholar, particularly in the humanities, being hedged around by all kinds of managerial diktats and managerial presences. We have, for example, uh, line managers in the departments which are supervising the work. We have certain pressures that the work should be modified so that it will fit in to the production schedule of the so-called REF, Research Excellence Framework. And I want to read out from my book uh, a description from a young historian, not at Oxford, one of the newer universities, about what this is actually like at the grassroots. And I think you'll see there's a kind of parallel with what goes on 
at Amazon Corporation. The, bureaucrati the bureaucratization of scholarship in the humanities is simply spirit crushing. I may prepare an article on extremism, my research area, for publication in a learned journal. And my REF line manager focuses immediately on the influence of the journal, the number of citations of my text, the amount of pages written, the journal's publisher. Interference by these academic managers is pervasive and creeping. Whether my article is any good or advances scholarship in the field are quickly becoming secondary issues. All this may add something to academic productivity, but is it worth selling our soul for it? So what I would say in absolute conclusion is that I believe that the economics profession has to be rebalanced from macroeconomics, which quite rightly looks at the aggregate uh, statistics for economic performance, but, but more in favor of this humanist economics, which looks at these profound issues of the interaction between technology and the workplace and the impact that it's having. And this obliges economics, I think, to be much more open to multidisciplinary uh, disciplines and much more open to the influence of history because one of the things I haven't discussed is where these biases in corporate culture come from. And they come from a deep and rich history. And maybe we can investigate that in the Q&A session. Thank you. I don't know if this is the first time at an INET conference we've had an Ayn Rand hero pop up as an opening slide. But in some ways, this is what um, all of us are reacting against, this heroic depiction of innovation. Um, I'm going to give a few perspectives from the shadow world that I inhabit, the shadow world in between research and public policy. Um, I think the first important point to make here is that there's been, over the last years, an incredible refreshing of the way people think about innovation in this field. Um, there's been a move away from these two predominant myths, the myth of entrepreneurial hero worship and the myth of innovation as a kind of an abstraction, an abstraction that's universally good. Seen here are the picture of uh, Elon Musk, or is that Tony Stark from Iron Man? I always get confused. And the kind of the, 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 the TFP equation. Um, and I think all of us would acknowledge that Mariana has been one of leading the charge in changing some of these perceptions. Um, this has been very refreshing, and I'm getting the feeling in the conversations I have with UK policymakers, with policy with policymakers in Europe um, and in the US, that this message is kind of gradually being taken on board. I think at this stage, I'd like though to caution against two possible false dichotomies that we may be ending up in. The first is this dichotomy between the entrepreneurial hero who constructs innovation with his or her, usually his, bare hands, and on the other hand, a kind of unquestioning acceptance of um, a massive shift towards state involvement, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And at the same time, there's a risk that we move from an unquestioning and kind of incurious acceptance of innovation as this kind of homogenous lump to an innovation pessimism. Some of you will recognize this bottom right-hand picture. This is um, Rossum's Universal Robots, the 1920s movie that originated the concept of robots. This is the moment where the robots uh, rise up and overthrow their human masters. And it's, there's the kind of pessimism and technological determinism that I'm increasingly seeing in some of the debates around the moral character of technology as well. And I think in both of those, there is an imp some important nuances to pick out. I'll talk about both of those in turn. Um, if we, talk about the, um, if we talk about the question of the public versus private sector role in innovation, I think it is important to not only acknowledge that the public sector has an important role to play, but to try and unpick what exactly the private sector is doing here. I think it's very clear from Mariana's work, from Fred Block's work, from Bill Ozonic's contributions, and from many others, that these fundamental, very basic investments in breakthrough innovations are in many, many cases being made by the state. 
and the iPods kind of carry on with Mariana's example is a great example. The MP3 protocol was made by German scientists in the Fraunhofer Institutes. The touch screen kind of originated from some European physics experiments. Obviously, the semiconductors on which it are based are the results of large amounts of American defense spending. And kind of the whole thing was backed with venture capital, which originally came from US state-funded programs. But I think in thinking about, well, what has the private sector actually done here, it's worth thinking about another product. And this will be less familiar to you. I used to have one of these um, about 15 years ago. I don't know if early adopters like Quentin might have had one. It was called a Creative Nomad Media Jukebox. And it was a real piece of junk, to be honest. Um, it had a mighty six gigabit memory. Um, and uh, it basically did what an iPod did before iPods existed. It was a terrible product. It was unuser friendly, it would jump around all the time. If you tried to use it for anything, it had this habit of crashing, the battery life was terrible, and it didn't have iTunes store, so you couldn't actually buy things. If we think about the innovations that Apple put into the iPod, um, these are kind of, these are not the stuff of Albert Einstein or the stuff of DARPA. But nevertheless, they're not insignificant if you're talking about making money. Most of the, tech, the public technologies were available to the guys who made the, uh, the, the, the product on the left, which I, to my chagrin, bought. Um, but they didn't manage to make the same kind of thing with it. And it's kind of interesting to sort of say, well, how does this stack up numerically? These are figures from the UK um, about investment in innovation. If we look at publics, but you get similar things if you look at other OECD countries. If you look at um, public sector investment, those two bars, those three bars are kind of higher education, public investment, government-owned account investment, plus a few public corporations. Total's about 10 billion pounds and 15 billion dollars. Very significant. You know, this is far larger than big corporations like GlaxoSmithKline in the UK are spending. But if we compare that to private sector investments, the kind of things that you need to turn something like the Creative Media Jukebox into the iPod, for a start, your R&D chunk is larger. That's about 17 billion um, there. And then if you follow the kind of Carol Corrado intangibles accounting method, which uh, is one way of thinking about these other hidden types of innovation, you're looking at adding on design, you're looking at adding on new product innovation, innovative training to deliver new services. Sorry, there's a kind of whole queue of them here. Um, According to the kind of OECD methodology, this gives you about 140 billion pounds. I would probably junk at least half of it, but even so, you're still talking about fairly significant private sector investments. And of course, these things aren't riskless. Um, a couple of Canadian companies who have uh, lost a lot of money as a result of the innovation system. Um, Nokia, a company that kind of missed a couple of product cycles, even in the presence of a very supportive developmental state, did bounce back, but nevertheless, a lot of shareholder value was lost. Clearly, I don't need to tell people invo involved in this that this is not a risk-free process of the private sector. Now, you may well be asking at this stage, why am I standing here shilling for these tax-dodging, share-buying-back corporations? And I want to make clear that that's not what I'm doing. I think the, 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 one of the most important messages in public policy in the last five years is that the state's role is essential. The point that I'm trying to make here is that we need to focus, if we're thinking about a future research agenda, as much on what the state is doing as on a strict transfer of resources between the private sector and the state. How the state works, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, is incredibly important and really should be where we're concentrating our research resources if we want to make public policy that's better. Um, by the same token, the other kind of false dichotomy, if we go back to this, uh, this, this question of technology for good or technology for bad, I think the, 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 the arguments that Simon has set out in Mindless, which is his first book, and um, to some extent, even the kind of thing that Eric Brynjolfsson, for all we disagree with him, has said in Race Against the Machine, is that clearly some technologies can have significant negative effects. This is an important thing we should realize that gets lost in dissolving TFP into this kind of uh, faceless, colorless term in an equation. However, there is a danger that we go too far and, to, and assume that these technologies are deterministic. And if you look at the tone of some of the books on this, uh, Tyler Cohen recently published a book called Average is Over. There is a certain fatalistic machismo, machismo about some of these things that make us assume that there's not that much we can do. And I think Jim Balsilli mentioned, made the very good point earlier that we've got to realize that to some extent we're in control of these things. Technologies are power biased, something that comes across very clearly from Simon's book. Um, but 
it, we, power still exists, and it's something that we have the right to control and something that we should put at the heart of our research agenda. Um, just a kind of a little intellectual diversion. I don't know if anyone's seen this picture, these little golden men. These are the golden robots of the Duke of Burgundy from the late Middle Ages. So if any of you are familiar with C-3PO from Star Wars, um, the, 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 the medievals got there a long time ago. And one of the fascinating things, there's been some fantastic research done by E.R. Truitt at Bryn Mawr about this. Um, people talked about robots, and people talked about power bias technological change long before really any meaningful technologies existed at all. There are fantastic stories of uh, emissaries to the Byzantine Empire in the 10th century encountering robots, which half the time these were kind of figments of people's imagination. These weren't even real automata. And the entire depiction of them is in terms of the power they allowed people to exert. So I think it's a useful aid memoir that the idea of seeing technology as power distorting is in some ways hardwired in our culture. It pre-exists technology. Um, so where does this leave us? I would suggest if we're interested in influencing public policy for the better, there are three ways we can take forward the huge contribution that Mariana and Bill and Simon and others have made. The first thing is identifying public policies that work. Um, now, Nestor, together with the University of Manchester, recently uh, completed this uh, kind of mammoth literature review looking at the academic evidence, the effectiveness of 19 different types of innovation policy. And uh, well, the reason I've not talked about it a lot in public is because the, the evidence was disappointingly thin. For most of these policies, there's very little academic research into what works, partly because the public sector doesn't gather the data. There is no culture of experiment. The kind of thing you see J-PAL doing in development, for example, with randomized control trials, is an entirely fresh idea to innovation policymakers, I'm ashamed to say. Um, and at the same time, these interventions are extremely complex, so it's difficult to piece together. I think that came across very clearly in some of the great stories Mariana tells in um, the entrepreneurial state. These are complex interventions. They're not like R&D tax credits, where it's easy to do some uh, you know, regression discontinuity analysis and some cute econometrics. You really need to get under the skin and understand these things, which incidentally is a place where new economic thinking and qualitative methods can make a big contribution. Um, but I think there is a, um, that is a, 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 an extremely important area to look at. Um, just a little shout out to some local heroes. I spent yesterday at Mars, not the planet, but the Toronto-based Health Tech Innovation Center, where they're working on this kind of extremely difficult craft problem of how to do for healthcare technology what DARPA did for the silicon chip back in the 50s and 60s. How do you link up these enormous engines of government procurement to innovative creation and science and technology? And the disappointing but true news is that this is a very tough craft. It's really hard to do, and we need as much craft and action knowledge to do this as we can. The second avenue of inquiry kind of ties much more into Simon's world, and it's that we need an ethical framework for talking about innovation. We've talked about this before, but again, I'd like to share with you some other research that we've been doing um, that we're going to be publishing in two weeks. And it's, to my knowledge, the largest uh, study of public attitudes to innovation and innovation policy that's been conducted. If you know of another one, I would like to see it, so please tell me. Um, but um, it showed something fascinating that maybe a surprise, it was a bit surprise to me, I don't know if it would be a surprise to you, that certainly looking at the UK, about one in five people, 20% of the population, were kind of had a wired magazine attitude to innovation. On the whole, they thought that innovation were, was, was kind of good. They were like the people Quentin hangs out with in Silicon Valley. They were, uh, they were, they were kind of innovation positivists. It was a positive brand for them. Um, the rest of the population was interesting, though. They were not by any means Luddites, to use a word that's sometimes unfairly applied. These guys were actually extremely positive about technology with one big caveat. You had to not use the word innovation, and you had to explain it to them in societal and indeed ethical terms. You had to explain why this was good, what good it was doing for the world. So they health technology breakthroughs, the kind of thing that we're probably going to hear a little bit more about soon, really resonated with these people. They were strong supporters of it. And if you prep them in that way, they were supporters of the kind of ambitious innovation policies that Mariana has pointed out are extremely important. Um, if you didn't, they came back to the kind of points that Simon has been making, that innovation is good for some people and bad for other people, and the people it tends to be good for are the rich and the powerful. Um, the rich and powerful were kind of concentrated in that top 20% of the innovation of files, incidentally. Um, so the idea of, uh, the idea of uh, bringing that up is extremely important. 
And then the last point that I want to make, and this ties a little bit into Simon's point about Oxford University, that dear place. Um, this is about not the social returns of innovation, but the social process of innovation. And this is something that, as far as I can see, has been deeply underexplored in the literature. Um, the idea of how people come together, particularly as the innovation system is being broken into pieces, with corporate research, R&D labs, a thing of the past, startups doing innovation and then being bought up by other companies, there is a great deal of need to combine practice knowledge and academic knowledge about how those processes of innovation between people arise. When I look at the kind of nightmares going on in Oxford and other universities around managerialism and trying to increase academic output, I see partly a kind of standard story about managerialism. I also see a desperation on the part of these people to try and make collective intelligence, collective discovery work. They are like surgeons in the days of the humors, trying to work out what's going on. So if I was to kind of speculate another avenue of useful inquiry, it would be that. How can we understand how these things work? And again, it's an area where new economic thinking is vital. The combination of economics, innovation studies, and deep qualitative understanding like ethnography. These are the three things from a public policy perspective that I think can make a huge difference, can turn innovation into something that really leads to social progress and will turn the public policy agenda around to something that we, I think, all collectively share as an important thing. Thank you very much. I'm a student of the natural world that happens to be a physician and a physician that happens to be an investor. So I'm going to take the perspective of that great innovator, nature, and natural selection. How many people here have children under the age of 12? I've got a couple myself. A lot of you. Now, we all know that when we spend time with children, they point out things that we can no longer see. I've walked around the block around my house 100 times, and every time I was out with my son, this is Jeremy when he was three, he would point out things that I'd never seen before. Now, let's illustrate this notion through an exercise. I'm going to put up a slide that contains a sentence, and all you have to do is count the number of times the letter F appears in the sentence. Just read it once. You ready? And when you're done, please look back at me so I know you're done. OK, how many people saw all three? Most of you. How many people saw four? A couple. Anybody see five? OK, two. So the real answer is six. And now that you know the answer, See if you can see all six. And I'll give you a hand. Five flies of, of, scientific, and of. OK, so at around age 12, we lose the ability to see things. Not a single child under the age of 12 gets this question wrong, and very few above the age of 12 get this question right. So what's going on here? Turns out this issue doesn't just relate to counting letters. At age 12, we also lose the capacity to learn a new language, play the violin, ski. In fact, this situation is not unique to humans. If you take a songbird from one part of the country and take them over to another part of the country, at a young enough age, they can learn the new song. But after a certain age, the age of puberty, they can't learn any more songs. So why would nature have endowed us this template of being open to the world for 12 years and then being closed to it, but executing fairly effectively against what we learn? Well, that is because the period under which humans evolved was very different than this. Let's call it the Pleistocene age. And at the time, humans lived on average of about 20 years and the world never changed. So whatever world you deconstructed during the first 12 years, you could reliably execute against during your next 12 years, and then you die. In the modern world, two things have changed. The context has changed. 
We are no longer dying at 20. In fact, somebody born today could expect to live 100 years. And the second thing is the world is changing rapidly. So the world that we deconstructed during the 12 years of our youth no longer exists. So we're all living in the time capsule of the first 12 years of our lives. Now, this is the explanatory framework behind why teenagers act like they know it all. They're supposed to know it all by 12, by nature's prescription, and they're supposed to move on. But we know they know nothing, which is why we keep them under our roofs. It's also the reason why generation gaps occur. People are living in the time capsule of their first 12 years. It's also the reason why technology is hard to adapt as we get older, adapt to as we get older. So think about this. Some of the deepest issues in society may relate to the fact that we can no longer see what's in front of us. Our minds have changed from being a camera, which it was the first 12 years, into a projector. It's hard to listen, it's hard to see. If you think about some of the darkest issues, some of the biggest social issues, may result from the fact that we are no longer open to the world. You know, our ideologic frameworks are first forged largely during our first 12 years as well. And then we grow up and we start projecting it upon others. Same with academics. In fact, the biggest casualty of this phenomenon, this evolutionary dislocation, may be intellectual life itself. Maybe some of the biggest problems have remained unsolved not because it's hard, it's because we can't see anymore. This also represents a huge opportunity. So I'm gonna apply this framework to the question posed for the panel. Here's our process. Three steps to the process. How are we wired? Number two, in what ways are the ways we are wired no longer relevant during contextual change, as the world changes? And number three, how do we overcome these maladaptations? We can certainly try to domesticate our feral instincts. We can also set up incentives and deterrents to produce the outcomes we want to see. I'm gonna give you examples of how we apply this in our own business, all the way to how it relates to our topic. Have you ever wondered why the stoplights are colored the way they are? It's because it maps to our prehistoric biology. If you did nothing but walk towards green, you probably improved your evolutionary fitness. If you did nothing but walk away from red, you probably improved your evolutionary fitness. That makes sense, right? Now what happens if you apply these colors to a stock screen? Stocks move up randomly almost every day. And if you like a stock at 146 and it goes up to 147, should it be green or should it be red? Now, this is the kind of thing that actually creates intrinsic momentum and volatility and booms and busts when it accumulates in aggregate. So in our office, we flip the green and red, and then we eventually use the neutral colors. Now, booms and busts. Booms and busts are a source of inequality. In our business, the way we talk about it is, it's not a bubble until all the retail investors have just gotten in. It's also not the bottom until the retail investors have sold everything. So bubbles are not healthy. It does produce innovation, though. When you're in a bubble, it draws on a lot of capital. People take a lot more risk, and some good things come out of it that help support the next wave. But bubbles are, bubbles and booms and busts are problematic. And a lot of people are studying this from an economic perspective. What are the causes? George Soros has advocated this idea of reflexivity, the idea that increase in price improves perception, of what's going on, which actually effectuates fundamentals and therefore the price increase is justified. I'm gonna introduce a new idea on top of this, which is something I observed during the last boom bust cycle. In 2007, I saw that a house in my neighborhood went up by $100,000 and all 100 households marked up their house by $100,000 in a mark-to-market world. A bank will lend against that. They would get home equity, buy Apple stock, which drove up Apple stock prices, then they would leverage that, go to margin, and buy another house. So what was happening was small increases in price was dramatically increasing liquidity. 
So in a perverse sort of way, as prices were going up, things were getting cheaper relative to liquidity. This is insane. In 2008, when prices fell by a half, everybody said, oh my god, historic buying opportunity. Then I would ask them, just go buy it if it's so cheap. And they said, well, we have no money. Because when you do lever, liquidity disappears so fast that as prices are falling, relative to liquidity, things are getting more expensive. This is not a good system. So I would invite people, economists, to help me figure this out. Uh, I want to know if, it, if it's real, and if so, what we can do about it. Milton Friedman essentially said that money supply creates price. What's well, possible that actually price in a wag the dog kind of way increases money in the liquidity sense. And that's a pernicious cycle. John Keynes once said, in the long run, we're all dead. As it turns out, in the long run, we're not quite dead. This is Eric Idle. And this is a big issue because in our primordial and prehistoric past, every meal was a life and death encounter. Either you're going to eat or they're going to eat. So long-term investing had no selection value. In fact, it was probably selected against. Now that we live in a world where almost none of us are dying over the long term, I'm 46 years old and I've lost one friend in 46 years. He passed when his plane was driven into one of the Twin Towers. So we are now living in a world where short-term thinking is maladaptive. And we know so many people that are not preparing for their retirement. This is an evolutionary dysfunction. All right, so the main point I want to make, these are just small examples. There's a major high-level evolutionary displacement going on that we need to be mindful of that I think addresses our topic. I studied with E.O. Wilson at Harvard, and he was an entomologist, and he studied ants. And ants are a very interesting species. They're a social species, but if you look at their organization, the queen bee gathers, queen ant gets all the resources, reproduces, and there are a number, a high number of ants that do not reproduce and do not get resources. Talk about 99 to 1. I mean, it is as extreme as it gets. It's, it's extreme dispersion of success, and yet they're so cohesive, so productive. In fact, these guys are so good, these social species, social insects, comprise one-fourth of the biomass on the planet. What can we learn from these guys? I come from a rice farming family. Our family's been together since 872. I'm generation 38. This is my grandfather. And in our village, there's still not been a household without the last name Yoon. 500 households at its peak. We're like an ant colony. The degree of stewardship was incredible. It's called kin selection. The idea was first developed by Fisher and Haldane in the 30s, popularized by William Hamilton in the 60s. The idea that when you live among close kin and there's very, very little population viscosity, people don't move around, and the dispersion rates are low, you can reliably be altruistic and have your genes passed on. That's the world we came from. It's the world we live in today. I mean, I look at our panelists, all five of us were born in different countries. Look at all of you. We probably represent dozens of different countries. Energy costs are low, communication costs are low, and we're living in a hypermobile society completely away from kin and among strangers who become friends. Now that transition has done, it's a dislocation. It is cr creating some awkwardness during this transition period. That's the period we're in right now. Because we're wired for tribal instincts and a degree of stewardship that comes from kin stewardship, and we're transitioning to a world that anthropologists call reciprocal altruism. It's reciprocal stewardship. But during the intervening period, things are a little awkward. There are definitely people that are practicing extraction. There's some doctors that do what's best for their pocketbook instead of their patients, but they're in the minority. There are politicians that extract votes 
instead of servicing their constituents, they're still in the minority. So I'm not saying there aren't extractive practices going on, because there's high agency costs today. You don't have relatedness to guide you, but we have other principles that we're developing as a society, collectively. So yes, there's extraction, but we're also in migration. So how do I feel about the future? Is it going to be the train wreck that you'll see in a lot of these dystopian narratives? I'm going to take a bet on the other side for three reasons. Number one, and this is hiding in plain sight, the population is now flattening and it may decline this century. The reason is the longer we live, the more we forestall our reproductive decisions. You know, when you're going to live to 100, when you're 20 years old, you're not ready to get married. You want to do more due diligence. <laughs> People are under-replacing themselves. All the first world is depopulating. More and more third world countries are becoming first world. No country has gone backwards. So you connect the dots. We may be depopulating very soon. In a depopulating wor world, all the models that are based on empirical data are going to break because our models were built on Malthusian assumptions of scarcity and competition. Right, all these things, right? What happens in that kind of world? The natural resource scarcity equation goes away. You're not going to buy land because they don't make any more dirt, because they don't make any more people either. What are you going to do? What are you going to do asset allocation? Your aggregate demand is going to start to fall. Where is there value in a depopulating world? It's going to be in people, human capital, after all. Another reason for hope? Globalization. Now, globalization definitely does a couple of things to innovation and social return. It helps innovation be accessible to the masses, right? People all over the world have cell phone. In fact, when things become equal, one of the ways in which our mind betrays us is when things are equal, we can't see it anymore. There's all this equity being built up in the world, and we can't see it once it's diffused, like vaccines and cell phones. Our minds are wired for contrast. But more importantly, globalization is instilling a sense of global stewardship in the successive generation. Remember, we didn't grow up in this world, but the first 12 years that are being imprinted by people around the globe is that of a global community. I am so encouraged when I talk to the young people in Silicon Valley. They talk about different things that are going, that are going on in this conference. They talk about engagement. They talk about responsibility on top of their innovation. My father was Generation 37, Sung Hee Hyun. This is the world he grew up in, the rice farming family. But this is what Generation 39 looks like. It's my son, Jeremy, who had the opportunity to sing anti-war songs at the United Nations headquarters at a TED event that was streamed in 67 countries. And you know what, what he says when I ask him? Your generation's going to inherit a connected world. What are you guys going to do with it? And he says, Dad, don't worry. We're going to take care of it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'll open it up to questions in just a minute. I'm afraid we won't have a tremendous amount of time, but I think everybody will be around for the cocktail party, and they are a very approachable people with a lot to say, as you can tell. Now, I will lead off with one question. I'll play jump ball. Everybody, please come at this one. It seems to me that we have done an interesting job of questioning or um, demolishing a certain value system in which innovation helped. And I'll characterize this very briefly, which is, one in which there was a kind of, um, it was ateleological, if you will. It, it was just about process improvement for so much. And the language around that is reflected in things like the invisible hand of the marketplace simply correcting for behaviors and perpetually improving them. And the scientific method, which makes no judgments about final causes, but simply looks at process and finds more efficient ways. These kind of ways of thinking, these kind of metaphors, then went into scientific management, if you will. Or the you know, brave individual who was tinkering with the system uh, and making it perpetually better. And the capital returns were the metric by which this was judged. Um, so. When we talk about better social returns, in some sense, we wish to talk about things like work that has meaning, right? Or we wish to talk about equity. We wish to talk about a better life for the, the greatest number of people, which the previous system, the ateleological system, does not seem to have developed successfully. Um, 
what would the metrics be and the values be of some future system that provided greater social returns? What do we replace this with, in other words? I'll take a crack at this. So I, I believe stewardship is on the rise. Right. And a system based on stewardship, uh, which is distinct from a system based on leadership, can return us to uh, a organization, social organization, that both is innovative and is service-minded. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at a Wikipedia today, uh, stewardship uh, entry is this long. And if you look at leadership, it's reams of pages. So I think we're in the early days of the rise in cultural discussion of stewardship, but the young are talking about it. Yeah, the Green Movement is an interesting example of this. Um, the external interest of the world in certain political movements to rear square falls because the world disapproves of what's going on there as much as any internal event. And this is a new kind of politics. I'm not sure it involves all people of the earth yet, but Perhaps there's something in that. Anybody else have any other ideas what might be a, a metric for judging social return? Sure. Yeah, I, I'd just like to mention briefly one of the great sort of laboratories of, of exploring alternative ways of doing this things, and that's what happened at Xerox Park over a 12-year period, uh, the late 80s to the millennium, when a remarkable man called John Seely Brown was in charge, and it became an extraordinarily creative think tank for rethinking the ways in which Xerox Corporation used its systems in relation to machine repairmen and the people in the telephone call center who dealt with repairs. And you, and you saw two different versions of how the systems could be worked, you know, fighting it out uh, against each other in a sort of cockpit which was extraordinarily creative. And in one area, uh, the machine repairman who went out to the machines, the reformers won. And in the other area, the call center, they did not. But what one saw is the, uh, a concept of different regimes of production, and one which could be extremely liberating in terms of the way people did their work. Quentin, I don't know the answer, but I think I have an idea about how to get there. Um, there's been a real myth in measurement that somehow economic measurements are really about capturing reality, the kind of panopticon view of, of, mm -hmm. of measurement. And this is kind of why in some ways we've fallen into such a, or some people have fallen into such a trap about the way we treat GDP. I think if we want to work out what the metrics are to measure social progress, we need to accept and make ourselves comfortable with the fact that these are fundamentally political measures that effectively we're choosing what we want to measure and then setting up a metric to promote it. Whether that is measuring intangible investment, whether that's measuring subjective well-being, whether that's measuring um, healthy longevity, we need to work that out. We need to discuss it in a political context and have conversations with the people about it, and then we need to embark on them. I think we can't treat it purely as an intellectual task of finding the perfect measurement and then working towards it. Speaking of measurement problems, and I want to build on the idea of we should ask the people. This is the human century, after all. A survey was done asking the Japanese what their favorite innovations were of the 20th century. Uh, Walkman was number three. But coming in ahead of karaoke, which was number two, was instant ramen. So when we think about social returns, let's ask the people what they care about. Mariana? just to sort of open up how we even talk about value. I mean, I think that uh, you know, a massive revolution in how economists talk about value and the degree to which they even place it at the center of analysis happened, of course, when we went from an uh, objective theory of value, which in some cases was labor theory of value, but let's just use the word objective, meaning it was tied to investment, to cost of production, uh, to a subjective theory of value, where today you know, students are still taught that wages are related to preferences for leisure versus work. That revolution actually also then, um, if you want, fed down into different types of indicators that we use today to look at all sorts of things, including uh, what we've been talking about. And you know, my, um, my critique of the skill bias technological change uh, framework is really that you know, where do skills come from? They kind of come from the air in that framework. Skills we know are actually 
endogenously created from the investment process, both public and private. So what we have today, you know, I mean, this whole disengagement of the private sector is also in terms of skills and um, human capital formation. And so much, though, of what we then, you know, include also in GDP is actually rents. We know this from, I mean, anyway, it's too long of an issue, but the point is to even differentiate rents. So Ricardian rents from Schumpeterian profits, it has to be related to an underlying value theory. And the fact that we aren't debating value at that level anymore allows so much rent seeking to come off as value creation. So I would just say before we you know, add things like happiness indicators and, and leisure into how we measure GDP, let's first just get the rent out. Um, and to do that, you need to debate value. Mm -hmm. Should we take questions from the audience? Hello, my, nom, my name is Jan Höfler from uh, University of Göttingen. I'm sorry, uh, you'll have to start over. I, I didn't pick up. Go okay, my, my name is Jan Höfler from University of Göttingen. I have a question to Simon Head. Um, you uh, talked about the exploitation of workers at Amazon and about this um, research excellence framework that you have line managers like in a Soviet system that uh, can take control of the research. Um, I have a question, why do we as researchers not revolt, make a revolution against the system and uh, actually don't, don't take part in it anymore? For example, uh, the, the mathematicians, they, they started a boycott against Elsevier, against this uh, publishing company that uh, takes all the, the benefits out of the work that we do, that we produce, that we uh, supervise and uh, that in the end our institutions buy back. Um, why, why do we take part in this and don't do it like the natural uh, scientists who um, started this um, PLOS system, the public uh, library of so open the, science? So the, the question appears to be, why don't academics and researchers walk away from these stupid systems? Yeah, that's, a, that's a really good question, actually. And, uh, and I have to say that some of us at Oxford have started a, a movement to, to fight this, this, this whole system. But it doesn't answer the question why academics in the sort of 20 plus years that it's been in existence haven't revolted against it. Um, and I think one of the reasons is that from Mrs. Thatcher's time onwards, academics in the UK have lost status. They've certainly lost earnings. They, they've really been bashed by one government after another. And, and I think they've suffered a kind of loss of morale, quite honestly. And um, I, I think it's most unfortunate that they've acquiesced in this r ruinous system. OK. Yes, sir. Um, yes, yeah, Adair Turner. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the relationship between investment and innovation. I thought this was a wonderful panel, lots of great ideas, much of which I agree with. The, the one bit I'm not so sure is a crucial part of the story is the problem of the cash accumulation by businesses. Because at least there is a thesis that one of the reasons why we had very low real interest rates even before the crisis is that we have a low demand for investment because, frankly, quite a lot of investment goods are pretty cheap. I, machines in the sense of hardware and software that retailers and manufacturers buy, just as a fact, are falling in relative price relative to uh, current prices. And therefore, it may be that we have some businesses which are simply making profits where they fundamentally don't need to invest. And they may, uh, it may be perfectly sensible for them to return that money to shareholders or somebody else to get reinvested elsewhere. So is it possible that we're absolutely right that there's a problem about innovation, that there's a role for the state, but we simply have to accept that there are some bits of business which don't have all that big investment needs because the price of capital goods is falling in some parts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure what Apple would do um, beyond what it's already doing, but it's accumulating huge amounts of, uh, of cash. Well, let me just footnote that, too, by asking, has there ever been a period in which the private sector was not recycling capital to this extent? Yeah. yeah, so um, first of all, I mean, I should get Bill Lozonic here to answer part of this. Maybe he can come in later. But if you look at which sectors are the biggest buybackers, right, it's actually oil and pharmaceuticals. You then talk to them. 
the you know, CEOs and say, why aren't you reinvesting your profits into you know, research and development, human capital? And the answer is, there's currently no opportunities for investment, right? So almost saying what you were saying, you know, could it be that actually this is the best thing to do? Then we look at where, you know, there's no uh, opportunities in renewables, there's no opportunities in you know, new health uh, uh, areas, of course there are, and then you look at the public spending and it's exactly in those areas that it's extremely high. So, and uh, I mean also going to the whole shareholder value problem, that particular framework is actually justified precisely in terms of you know, the shareholders being the biggest risk takers, right? So this whole uh, residual claimant idea that somehow everyone else has a guaranteed rate of return, and if there's something left over, the residual, is the shareholders that have the right to it because they took the biggest risks. So this is why I keep emphasizing that we have to revolutionize how we talk about risk. You know, who are the risk takers? It's a much more collective process. And so when there is a big booty left over, as there was with biotech, as there was with dot-com, as there will be with clean technology, because that will be the next big bubble after the student loan bubble, which will be massive, but anyway. Um, you know, who has the right to that booty and who has also the right to also be reinvesting the profits before they are, um, if you want, eligible for all these different types of, of so uh, tax cuts. what you're saying, in effect, is in oil and gas and in pharmaceuticals, if basic research was the seed corn, they'd eaten it all. And there was just nowhere to deploy the money anymore. There was no basic research in the preceding 10 or 20 years against which they could deploy the, that capital, so it just backs up? No, I mean, the there's... Goes back to shareholders. The capital will go, go back to underlying investors who then reinvest in next innovation. That's what we do. 40% of our portfolio is buying back shares, and we take that and put it into the next, next great innovation. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if you want to open it up. I think Go it's ahead. extremely controversial. Go ahead. Um, I mean, first of all, let's just also just say something else, which is the problem is it's not, I mean, the last thing I would want to argue is that the state is always good when it's making these kind of investments. The problem is also that the framework that's then being set for the state when it enters is often a very narrow one. So coming back to life sciences and pharmaceuticals, the real question is why is it all about drugs? There's huge opportunities in lifestyle. You know, it's a bunch of hippies like us that know what it means to live smart, but there's no proper research in that area. There's hardly any research in diagnostics and surgical treatments. All the investments are around drugs, and so when we talk about where are the future opportunities in life sciences, in the green economy, it should really be a very wide understanding of how to be transformative in those spaces. And it's very hard to argue that there's no current opportunities that the energy companies should be investing in, or the big pharmaceutical companies should be investing in, um, if they, you know, if we were to get to a more symbiotic public-private partnership as we had in the years of Xerox Park. It's the boundaries of that space that need to be redefined. I'm going to take one final question on this side and annoy the organizers just a little bit. We're slightly over. Two points. I was at one time an economist for a major oil company, and let me tell you that the idea of factorization, et cetera, was on the geologist's mind even then. And there's, that, that's a tremendous investment that oil companies have made in this uh, method. So they, they did invest in this. Uh, why they didn't uh, 10 years ago or something is another question. But the other point that I want to make is what's the metric for social returns? And it's very simple, it seems to me. Uh, Keynes pointed out that the two flaws of the capitalist economy is the arbitrary and inequitable distribution of income and wealth. The measure of social returns and private returns is as the economy is growing, whatever measure of growth that you use, is the income distribution getting less unequal as it did from the 1930s till the 1970s, or is it getting more unequal? If it's getting less unequal, then you see there must be some mechanism that is producing private returns into social returns. And that is what we ought to be aiming for. Uh, how do we do it is another question, but that's what new economic thinking ought to be doing. How do we get progress to fit all people, and especially the people at the lower levels, even more than the people in the top 1 or 10%? Okay, so the, the gap is the sign of a market or system failure. Its closure is the healthiest metric. We could pull that one apart for an hour, and it's fantastic. Unfortunately, we run out of time. I love a panel where I feel like I could just keep going, and this has certainly been one. Let's give our panelists a big hand. Thank you.
Okay. All right.